OK, good morning, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. Thanks for uh, attending today. Those of you in person and those of you uh, who are virtual, we appreciate uh, you being here today to hear about what is really an important subject. I know uh, navigating the, the pandemic has been difficult on everybody. Uh, we've noticed lately that our uh, questions about safety and health uh, procedures have kind of started to wane a little bit, but our questions about uh, human resources and, and what we can and cannot do as organizations, uh, those have gone through the roof. So this is a very timely subject and we're very excited to uh, have our presenters here with us today. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to them right now from Frost, Frost Brown Todd. We with us today, we have Kate Coop Irwin and Eric Kimball. And I'm going to turn things over to Eric to uh, introduce Kate and our subject today. So thank you. Yep. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Eric Kimball. You may or may not know me. I've been a MBA member probably 20 plus years. I do uh, primarily construction claims, disputes, and front end work. May have ran across some of you at some point there. Uh, my partner, Kate Coop Irwin, is here today to do uh, kind of a, a touch up or a potpourri of what's going on right now in the law. Hopefully, you can apply that to your current situations, and we're also here to answer questions today. Um, so we're going to go through quite a bit of information and do have some time at the end, but if you have a question during the presentation, either raise your hand or uh, send us a chat question. And Kate's been in practice for about 15 years now, uh, almost exclusively employment law, and she just joined us from Tucker Aaronsburg, where she had been for 15 years, and we're growing our office in Pittsburgh. We now are about to eight, 10 attorneys, something like that, and probably going to see some more growth here currently. And then to the extent you don't know about uh, Frost Brown Todd, we have about 520 lawyers and 13 offices. Uh, furthest west, I guess, is Dallas. Furthest north, Michigan. Furthest east is DC. So pretty much the Midwest area with a little bit of uh, East Coast and, and then a little bit further west. So without further ado, I'd like to let Kate talk. And again, uh, thank you for joining us and hope everybody learned something. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much. Thanks for everyone joining us. So we are here to talk about changes in the state of HR. And let me just move through our slides. Um, so that's a photo for those of you who are virtual. Now you can say that you've seen both Eric and I via photo, but that's a photo of me on the left and Eric on the right. But thanks for being here. It's a pleasure to, to talk with you all. Um, today's topics we are going to include um, Returning to work in a COVID world, vaccines, quarantines and leaves, accommodations and other best practices, changes under the Biden administration, DOL, NLRB and the Supreme Court and things you may have missed in the chaos of 2021 and issues to watch. I'm going to take a brief second here to pause because those of us in the room are not actually seeing the advancement of my slide. So in a tech world, if you give us one second, that'd be great. Okay, um, so everybody can hear me again. Moving forward. Again, so today's topics, again, we're going to talk about returning to work in a COVID world. We're going to talk about vaccines, quarantines, leaves and accommodations and other best practices, changes under the Biden administration, we're talk talking about OSHA, Department of Labor, NLRB. There are a lot of changes coming down the pike with the new administration and new personnel, new secretaries, and then things you may have missed in the chaos of 2021 and issues to 
to watch. We're all focused on a lot on pandemic um, related issues, safety related issues, but a lot happened in the past year and a half as well that's unrelated to COVID. So first, let's talk about new legal issues in a post pandemic world. Vaccines to incentivize or not to incentivize. That is the question, right? Many of us at this point in time now that the vaccines have been available, largely available for a number of months, are considering whether or not we A, require vaccines or B, incentivize employees to receive the vaccine as a way to increase the percentage, especially with the Delta variant coming through our workforces. What is an employer left to do? Well, first, let me tell you that the EEOC has come out and actually said um, that employers can require employees to be vaccinated. So you you may have heard on the news, for example, largely healthcare institutions at first were requiring vaccines, then it became educational institutions. As of late with the new Delta variant, um, private companies, non-health related companies are increasing their requirements of employees to have vaccines. That's everybody from Walmart to Netflix um, to Amazon. All are requiring employees to have vaccines, but if you want to short of requiring an employee to have a vaccine and you can also incentivize employees to have a vaccine. So if you are not involved and you're just asking an employee to go out into the community and get a vaccine, you can. The EEOC has said that you can incentivize employees through monetary benefits and that there's in fact no limit on those monetary benefits. So you can do it everything from we've had clients who have created a lottery system where you'll be entered into a lottery to that gives away at the end of um, a month, for example, a given month, um, a few thousand dollars. You can offer time off to go and get the vaccine. You can offer paid time off, increased incentives, but there really is no limit so long as you're not directly involved in the employee getting the vaccine and or assisting the employee in getting the vaccine. So, so long as you're not holding a clinic at your work site, there's no monetary limit to the incentives that you can offer to employees to incentivize them to go out and get the vaccine. If you are involved, so if you are hosting a clinic or if you were a healthcare provider, I know this audience is not in the healthcare field, we're in the construction trades, but if you were a healthcare provider, you could, you did have a limit on the, the amount of vaccines that you were able to offer employees if you were directly involved. But so as long as you're hands off, there's no real cap or limit. The two exceptions are, is that you can't require employees to have vaccines if they have a disability related accommodation, if they can't have the vaccine or receive the vaccine because they have a disability that prohibits them. So counter, implications or if they have a religious exemption. But if an employee comes to you and says that they need an exemption for a requirement to receive the vaccine because they need a religious exemption or a disability exemption, you can in fact ask for documentation. Documentation from the medical provider in a disability context or documentation and an attestation from an employee stating that they truly do have a truly held religious belief that prohibits them from receiving the vaccine. Um, so you're not uh, required to take the employee's quote word for it, so to speak. Um, you can, in fact, ask for some mode of documentation as an exception if you decide to <clears throat> require employees to be vaccinated. Now, what documents can you ask an employee or vendors to provide showing that they've received the vaccine? So if you, for example, are a construction contractor um, if you're a vendor con contractor working for a hospital, so many hospitals are requiring their contractors to have employees and only send employees who have been vaccinated to a site. So if you're providing services, universities, the Indiana, uh, Indiana University, IU, not IUP, but Indiana University um, are requiring all students to receive the vaccine. And in fact, that decision went up to the Supreme Court. It was challenged. The Supreme Court declined to hear that case, which was sort of a passive way of acceptance, saying we're not going to hear the case. And the uh, appellate court's ruling upholding IU's requirement that all students receive the vaccine is now the law of the land um, relative to that circuit. But what that says is that IU also actually has a requirement that all of its vendors, all of its contractors, so they're building new buildings, on Indiana University's campus. All of its contractors must confirm that they are sending only employees to that site that have been vaccinated. So if that happens to you, and it wouldn't be surprising as we move through this pandemic, that that is an issue for construction trades employers, that if you have a vendor that's requiring you to only send employees who are vaccinated to their site, 
you can ask the employee. So say you don't have an incentive program or say you're not requiring all employees to have vaccines, but you do have a client that requires all employees to be vaccinated if you're going to send them to your site. You can ask employees for confirmation of the vaccine through HR. So they have to provide either a medical documentation slip from their own doctor or simply produce the vaccination card to prove that they've been vaccinated. If you have an employee who hasn't been vaccinated, so you're not requiring it, you can of course not send them to that vendor or that site. And then the key or tricky legal issue, of course, is what if you have an employee who has a disability, who can't receive the vaccine, and you're they're assigned to a project in which they have to be vaccinated. So you may have to make that decision to say, we'll assign you to a different project or a different site. There's not true case law on this topic as to what would be a reasonable accommodation, either to send or risk, right, violating the vendor's contract or the client's contract, or vice versa to assign that employee to a different contract or a different trade or site or project. Um, but that is something that I would think that would be percolating through the courts over the next number of months. Confidentiality. You should not produce if a client or a vendor asks for proof that your employees are vaccinated. You should not produce their actual documentation, but you can confirm that, for example, all we are adhering to the contract. So any employee that we are sending vis-a-vis -vis has been vaccinated, but you can't send the actual documentation proving that the employees that you're sending to that project are vaccinated. Um, you should just do an attestation at this point in time to maintain the employee's confidentiality. You should also, of course, if you do obtain documentation relative to an employee's vaccination status, you should maintain that separate and apart similar to other medical files, although it's not technically medical documentation. Now, how about can you ask employees to wear badges or other symbols indicating that they're vaccinated? Um, yes, there's not if you wish to do so, but there are legal risks, right? So there's an association with disability or other legal risks relative to an employee who, for example, may not be able to be vaccinated because they have an accommodation. So. Of course, there is no prohibition against having employees wear badges or symbols indicating that they are vaccinated, but proceed with caution on that issue. Are there different rules or can you institute different rules for employees who are vaccinated and unvaccinated? Yes, yes, you can. So, for example, you can institute different rules in which you can require employees who are unvaccinated to consistently wear masks through your work site. Um, you can allow employees who are vaccinated to meet without wearing of masks. You can institute different safety rules given that employees who are vaccinated may pose different risks as opposed to employees who are unvaccinated. So let's move from the vaccination issue to in a post pandemic world. What about employees who are asking for continued opportunities to work from home? And what if that relates to their disability status or their risk of becoming seriously ill if they contract COVID-19? So starting with the base, what if employees have, for example, by, for months now been working from home? What if an employee asks you or requests to continue to work from home? What should you do? Well, First, if there's no disability issue, right? They're not asking because they have a disability that would pose an increased risk. You certainly can continue if you'd like to grant that request to remote uh, to work remotely or work from home. However, a recommendation from a legal perspective is to document the reasons why that you're granting said request. If the employee has specific job duties that allow them more easily to work from home, then you should document that. Document that the granting of the request is not permanent in nature, it's only temporary in nature, so that if a different employee asks to, for example, continue to work remotely during the remainder of the pandemic, that you can distinguish if you're going to say no and not grant that request, why? So there's not a claim that you're treating two employees disparately or discriminately by granting one employee's requests and not the other. So distinguish the where's, the why's. Um, if the employee has performance issues that would not lean or lend themselves easily to working from home independently of supervision, then that may be a reason as well. Now, that's a situation in which 
no disability accommodations are implicated. But if an employee comes to you and says, what if I can't receive the vaccine and I, or I have the vaccine, but I'm still at risk of returning to work and have, being infected with COVID-19? Do you have to permit him or her to continue to work from home if they have a disability, a qualifying disability that would pose a risk to their health if they return to work? and they're asking to continue to work as an accommodation. Well, in most cases, right, you're gonna run through the standard accommodation process. You have to entertain that. You can't simply say no, right? So you're gonna have to go to the employee and go through the normal accommodation process. So what can you do if that, if you receive that request? You can A, right, ask for medical documentation from the employee's provider, establishing that he or she, in fact, does have a disability, so they have to have a disability first. It's not just that they have a fear of or that they may have a precondition. So it's not their own subjective fears, but in fact that they do have a documented disability that would lend itself to being at a higher risk of contracting COVID-19 or a higher risk of adverse effects of COVID-19 if contracted. And that the physician's recommending that they isolate um, and not return to work. So then you can ask for, for example, a length of time. You can reevaluate that to make sure that those conditions are still present. And then, of course, it has to not cause an undue burden, just like any other accommodation. So if you're in a situation in which um, it would cause an undue burden on the company to have an employee continue to report to work remotely, then you can evaluate that situation. If the employee's performance suffers as a result of working from home, that could in fact create an undue burden, right? So if the employee's performance is not up to par, if you run through the process of uh, supervision, if you run through the process of counseling and their performance is still lacking as a result of working from home, that could create an undue burden on the employer. Now, switching from COVID and pandemic issues to simply future requests to work from home, right? So say we don't have, say you have an employee who has a request to work from home, has a disability totally unrelated to COVID, but you've been providing telework or work opportunities to work from home for the past year and a half or the past year. Right? And now that same employee or a different employee in a similar position wants to continue to work from home because they have anxiety right, or a back condition that would their physician says would benefit from working from home or PTSD or some other type of mental condition that the physician says that they would benefit from continuing to telework. Do you have to adopt or grant that accommodation? Well, because it's a little harder, right? If that physician is attesting that they, in fact, A, have a disability and B, needed accommodation and the type of accommodation is working from home. It's much harder now that we've granted accommodations in the form of working from home or remotely to say, we used to say you have to be here, right? We have to have you present. It's part of the work. Well, it's now we've now sort of disproved that over the past year and a half that the work can be accomplish. So you really, I would recommend against taking a blanket no approach to those types of accommodations and really dig in and evaluate on a one-on-one -on -one basis how, if it is going to cause a unreasonable or undue burden on you to grant that accommodation, um, still run through the process and be really cautious that if you've just granted that employee or similar employees the right or the ability to work from home over the past year, you might have a be hard pressed to prove that it is an undue burden on you to grant them the continued opportunity to do so. So moving forward, let's talk about CDC, OSHA, state and local laws. So first remember OSHA, right, has only issued guidelines um, for most employers. Outside of the healthcare industry and education, CDC's guidelines relative to COVID are only guidelines and just that, they follow the CDC's guidelines. So if you go to OSHA's website when you're talking about pandemic preparedness and safety regulations, 
they will talk in generalities and issue guidelines to follow, but they're not necessarily mandatory requirements. And by and large, OSHA follows the CDC's guidelines. So what does that mean for us today, right? We've gone through a number of changes over the past year and a half. Um, there were some days in which either you as employers or HR professionals, either here in the room or at home, weren't sure what today was going to bring, right? What did we have to do today that was different? They were changing so often. Now, right, which was different than a few months ago with the Delta variant a few months ago, once you were vaccinated, you were thought to be fine. But the Delta variant CDC guidelines have changed. So CDC's current recommendations as of today are that our masks for the unvaccinated blanketly. So if you're unvaccinated, you should be wearing a mask inside at work. For vaccinated individuals, it is by the area or county. Um, and they're recommending that for inside or inside work areas, inside public areas, if you're in an area of high or <clears throat> transmission of COVID-19, which Allegheny County is, right, that you should be wearing a, a mask inside if you are vaccinated or be uh, spaced socially distantly. So here in the room, we're socially distant. If you're not, um, then you should be masked internally, inside. Um, now, taking a step back as far as what if you have a vaccinated individual who has been exposed to somebody who has tested positive for COVID-19? Right. So what if you have before six months ago, we had people who were either unvaccinated and coming in contact. We were had the we're following the 10 day quarantine requirements. We were paying FFCRA leave for even self quarantining, etc. Now take a little bit of a pivot and the question becomes, what are the current guidelines and requirements for individuals? If you've come into contact with an employee or a coworker or any other individual who we know has tested positive for COVID, but I'm vaccinated. Right? Do they have to quarantine? Do you have to grant them leave? And the answer under the CDC's recommendation is no, that you don't have to quarantine. If you're vaccinated and you come in close contact, which is defined as 15 minutes or more, totally over a 24 hour period um, within six feet of an individual who's tested positive, that you should, if you're vaccinated, you should wear a mask for three to five days around anyone else and then test after get a COVID test after that fifth day. So if you know that you're testing positive, if you've been in contact, close contact within six feet, over 15 minutes of somebody who's tested positive for COVID recently, you're supposed to mask, you're not required to quarantine, and then you should test, get a COVID test after the fifth day. Um, PA Department of Health guidelines continue to watch them. Um, they haven't really changed in the past say six or so months, we're starting to, they're starting to defer more to the CDC than anything else. There was a time in which the Department of Health had very different guidelines than the federal government. They were more restrictive, um, but that has sort of stopped a bit. So we've talked about vaccines and quarantining. Now, what if you actually need to take a leave to care for somebody or you do get a breakthrough case of COVID or somebody else in your family has positive for COVID? Well, the FFCRA, remember the Federal Fair <clears throat> Families First Coronavirus Response Act that we all sort of had to learn about on the fly last year, right? We had never heard about it before. It was a long abbreviation and it provided leave for individuals who either needed to care for somebody or themselves tested positive and it was paid leave. That expired um, at the end of last year. In December, employers up through the end of March could have provided voluntary FFCRE leave, continued FFCRE leave, and still have obtained a tax credit. So there is currently, as of today, there's no federal law that requires leave. There is for employers who are operating in the city of Pittsburgh, there is a recently adopted or renewed as of July 21st, a Pittsburgh COVID paid leave law. So if you have employees that are working, not only just you as an employer, your office is outside the city of Pittsburgh, but if you have employees that are working in the city of Pittsburgh, they, the city of Pittsburgh ordinance applies to all work being performed by employees in the city of Pittsburgh. 
and it, it would be a pro rata rate. So if they're not always working within the city of Pittsburgh limits, just occasionally you have to track those hours and it's one hour for every 30 hours work within the limits of the city of Pittsburgh. Um, and for those employees who are consistently working within the city of Pittsburgh, it's 80 hours, 80 hours of paid COVID sick leave. Now that piggybacks off of the Pittsburgh Paid Sick Days Act. So you might have heard about the Pittsburgh Paid Sick Days Act before. It's not in addition to that COVID leave law. It piggybacks off of it. Um, however, it does expand the COVID, the renewed Pittsburgh COVID leave law expands the reasons obviously why you can take it and it does not require that that sick time be um, accrued. So under the Pittsburgh Paid Sick Days Act, it was by time or hour where there's sort of an exception with the understanding that employees may need that those hours that have not been yet accrued when they get sick to be able to use them. So there's sort of an exception there. There is a question about whether an employee, if they already exhausted their 80 hours, of sick leave, um, whether it's under the Paid Sick Days Act or for COVID related reasons, are they entitled to new hours now that this new law has been adopted? And we expect to get more guidance from the city of Pittsburgh, um, from the mayor or city council soon. So there's a question in the back. Yeah, okay, um, with uh, the city of Pittsburgh, um, uh, it's pretty clear with salaried employees what we do there, but we've been advised of the, you know, most of our employers, members, uh, have collective bargaining agreements mm -hmm. with the various construction trades. We've been advised that the uh, there's no obligation to uh, pay them for sick days uh, being they're covered under collective bargaining agreements. Uh, have you heard anything on that? Well, so as far as the Pittsburgh paid um, the Pittsburgh paid sick days act that may be, I would be cautious under the COVID leave law. So for example, um, and really dig in and have to understand if there's a, an exception there to the extent that you're already providing it. So similar to the paid, for example, if your CBA already provides for 80 days or even more of, um, of leave. And, but it would not necessarily provide for, for example, leave to be taken with the appropriate notices or the leniency that the COVID sick days law applies. I would adhere to the COVID sick days law. I would not necessarily deny an employee leave, paid leave, because there is a CBA in place um, if they, for example, had the leave to take because they'd accrued such sick leave or vacation time under a CBA, but maybe they needed to provide more notice or they hadn't accrued it yet. So I would adhere to, until there's tr true clarification, I would adhere to the more lenient standard um, with an abundance of caution. Um, there is no uh, current paid state sick leave law right now. Um, whether or not it's COVID or non-COVID related. And then of course, FMLA may apply, right? So FMLA may apply in a lot of situations regarding the need for time off for employees to either care or recuperate, care for someone with COVID or recuperate from COVID. So tips for returning to work. So again, unvaccinated employees must still wear masks at work um, under CDC guidelines. Uh, if you're thinking or contemplating of a work party or picnic, whether or not it was over the summer or into the fall, follow certain safety parameters. For example, consider outside venues and specialty individual catering. Um, to be clear, under workers' compensation law, if someone would be sick as a result of attending a work party or picnic, even though they may think it's voluntary, if you are encouraging it and there could be some sort of um, expectation that they attend, and it's not purely voluntary, it could be in their injured or become sick at a party. It could be deemed a workers' compensation injury. So courts have, for example, the company softball game or the, um, employees who are injured at the company softball game, they have a valid workers' compensation claim. Apply that same analogy to a company-sponsored picnic. If somebody becomes injured or sick with COVID, um, it could be considered a work-related injury. So just take those safety precautions if you're having anything. And as we transition into colder weather with the Delta variant, something to consider about those types of issues. 
Um, certainly recirculating employee handbooks, uh, collective bargaining agreements, safety policies, leave policies to make sure employees understand what those protocols are. I think uh, certainly we were hyper vigilant in the earlier months and then we might have taken sort of a more lax approach throughout spring and summer. And with the increase of the Delta variant, it's certainly good to remind employees what your safety policies are. And then, of course, if as a manager or supervisor or HR representative, if you see someone who you know has not provided proof that they are vaccinated and they're not wearing masks, you should, as a safety precaution under OSHA and CDC guidelines, let them know that they need to be wearing a mask. You know, the the requirement I've defended at least three OSHA charges relative to safety, COVID safety protocols. Um, and while we've been largely successful in defending those employers, um, the fear is, of course, is that an employer is widely or rampantly not following COVID safety protocols and that an employee either becomes ill or infects someone else in their life with COVID, that person becomes seriously ill, injured, or dies, and then they sue the employer knowing or company knowing that and claiming that they did not follow CDC or safety protocols, and there could be significant liability at, at issue for either negligence from a third party or certainly workers' compensation claims for an employee. Okay. What if the uh, employee refuses? to wear a mask even after they've been counseled and you go through a termination process or whatever kind of improvement program, what's going to be, I know you, you can't say for certain, but what are the defenses around that, that kind of thing? Sure. So the question is, uh, what if an employee continually refuses to wear masks at work? Certainly in a collective bargaining agreement, you know, in a, in a unionized workforce, there are safety procedures and policies and management rights clauses um, that all employers have the right to adhere to and, and adopt different safety protocols. So certainly I would say document, discipline, counsel, etc. And then you know, if there is a discipline that's at issue, if the union grieves it, certainly following CDC and OSHA requirements right. would be, you know, the main kind of contention or point. Um, and then just really having good documentation about the, where the employee was seen, what they were doing, etc., that they hadn't provided proof or confirmed that they're not vaccinated, etc. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So here are some issues about remote work. Um, so if you're allowing employees to work remotely, so if you're more um, rather than your trades employees, if your office employees are working remotely, if you don't have a work from home policy or a work from home contract or agreement that an employee has signed off on, highly recommend considering doing so in that policy um, should be that you for safety issues that they have a remote work area dedicated in one place to the employee's home that's safe that's free from um, other clutter safety issues um, that there's a disclaimer in that agreement for others coming into the space who may be injured right so you can't disclaim an employee's injury at, if they're injured at home while working they may have a workman's compensation injury there's not really much you can do about it right so even if they trip over in their in their own kitchen in their own work environment and break their toe if they're working at home they may have a workman's compensation injury now do you want the next thing for a third party you may want to avoid if somebody comes into their home that they could argue that that is a work site and you're responsible right premises liability so what you want to do is have a contract with that employee that you're not liable for anything that happens at their home relative to a third party in their work site um, also have an agreement that they're required to keep their work information safe and secure, right? The worst thing would be to have employees, files, personnel, financials, contracts, private RFPs out for anyone to see in their work environment, whether it's printed papers or accessibility through their computer, they walk away, etc. You think that, right, or if they're, say, going to a coffee shop because they're working remotely and they step away or they leave papers, etc. So also um, in a work policy, work from home policy, is that they can only work at the agreed upon site. So they can't 
leave and go to a coffee shop, a Starbucks, et cetera, and A, pose a risk to security by accessing public internet or leaving papers um, out or having issues and confidential matters on their computer. So also um, having any agreement that they agree to give you access to the work site, reasonable access to the work site. So that may be that the employer can actually access and come into the home, et cetera, just, just to view it to make sure that it is safe. Um, have them agree, especially for employees who are non-exempt. Remember, these are hourly non-salaried employees um, who are not subject, who are subject to be paid overtime under the Fair Labor Standards Act, that all work must be done while clocked in and that full attention and time must be committed to work. So the biggest issue, of course, for non-exempt employees is that they're working sporadically. You can't track their time. They're not tracking their time accurately and that they could claim that they've worked more time than they have um, tracked. So, of course, if there are issues that the employee acknowledges and agrees to rescind the work from home arrangement. So if we thought that statistics during the pandemic for discrimination had gone away because we weren't working together, right? How much trouble could employees be whenever they haven't seen each other for a year and a half and they're working from home? That's not necessarily true. These are some statistics, right? Retaliation claims um, during the pandemic year, 55.8. Again, this is for the year 2020. So the pandemic started in March. So about eight months of what happened during the pandemic, and most of us were working remotely um, or separately, if, if at all, um, during some of the month of March. Disability-related claims increased. There were significant race claims, 22,000, sex or harassment claims, 21,000 as well. We have um, decreased a little bit national origin claims, only 9.5%. And then uh, at the bottom, Gene or Genetic Information Act claims. So again, these types of claims should still be on our radar, even if we weren't working remotely. They are pretty high. They weren't even less than 5% different from 2019. So, and again, 2019, we're all together. So transitioning now as, as that summary kind of what we looked at in 2019 and 2020 to what can we expect under the new Biden administration. The Trump administration rolled back or through executive order what we saw under the prior administration, the ease of enforcement, right? So there were less inspectors under the Department of Labor under the National Labor Relations Act, under OSHA, so there were less investigations. There were less enforcement priorities. So under the Obama administration, um, they had an increased enforcement for independent contractor issues. So if you use independent contractors and you were using them much like you would employees, there were in increased enforcement in those areas, increased enforcement in OSHA, etc. cetera. Um, that decreased under the Obama administration. And I think what the first thing we're going to see under the Biden administration is increased investigation and enforcement priorities. So not necessarily a change in regulation per se, right? We're not going to see a whole bunch of new laws under the Biden administration, but we're going to see increased enforcement. So just um, in the first, you know, six odd months that the Biden administration has um, been in, We've seen increased hiring. They've increased hiring for OSHA inspectors by almost 25%. The budget, when it was approved, provided increased funding for the hiring of investigators for the Department of Labor as well. So that means wage and hour increases in wage and hour investigations, improper pay, et cetera. Um, and OSHA certainly increased enforcement priorities for safety issues, catastrophic injury cases, and so on. But in addition to increased enforcement priorities, let's talk a little bit about personnel because personnel is policy and politics, right? Who you're appointing to these major, to head these major groups or departments certainly tells what your enforcement priorities and what we can expect to see over the next four years. So um, the head of OSHA, the newly appointed Assistant Secretary of Labor under OSHA is James Frederick. 
He is um, a Democrat, also uh, previously worked for OSHA, um, the Department of Labor. So the Secretary of Labor, Martin, goes by Marty Walsh. It's the first time in history in which we will have a current Secretary of Labor who used to be a union president. Um, so highly ingratiated in the labor world. Um, so certainly that sent a message from the Biden administration what those enforcement priorities were relative to the ability to unionize and other priorities um, for Mr. Walsh. And then certainly what I think we're going to see the most change in is the National Labor Relations Board. Right. So as we many of you know, who are either listening on the phone or in the room, remember the National Labor Relations Board is comprised of five members over the past number of years. And again, the National Labor Relations Board is the government agency or board that's charged or tasked with enforcing the National Labor Relations Act. Right. The right for employees to unionize, engage in concerted activity, collectively bargain and so on. And that board is made up of five members. Over the past number of years, two of those seats have been vacant because they could not actually confirm two seats. So with only three seats over the past number of years, although the board has certainly still issued decisions, they haven't necessarily had full precedential value. Um, and so they also, with these two seats rolling off as well and being filled, um, there are two new seats that have now been filled under the Biden administration um, to form a new Democratic majority on the board. So three to two. And those two new appointments will last until um, August of 2023 for the next two years. The newest board member is Gwen Wilcox. And she was sworn in in the beginning of August. A little bit about Ms. Wilcox, she's the first African-American board appointee to the board. And her background is as an attorney. And she previously worked for a union sided law firm in, I believe, New York. Yes, New York, pardon me. Um, that represented unions. She also served as Associate General Counsel to the SEIU. Um, and so with that in mind, certainly can tell you a little bit about where she might be leaning as far as decisions are concerned. Um, one of the first actions that the Biden administration also took was to terminate General Counsel Rob. Um, that was a Trump appointee. Of course, he the Biden administration could do that fairly easily because it didn't take it didn't require Senate action. He then appointed Jennifer Abruzzo, who is the new general counsel. Uh, most recently, Ms. Abruzzo has uh, issued a general counsel memo on August 12th that sets forth her enforcement priorities and the, her enforcement priorities. I'm going to just switch two slides. It lays out an agenda for regional directors, officers in charge, and residents, um, resident officers for the National Labor Relations Board for the next two to three years. The, high, the memo highlights three different subjects that are going to be the clear enforcement priorities. So this is really right out of the gate, really just a shot across the bow to let everyone know that this these were her enforcement priorities and were going to be the board's enforcement priorities largely is that the first was to rescind or review cases and subject matter where the board, she believes that the board over the last three years overruled legal precedent, meaning they're going back and going to be challenging many of the decisions that have been issued over the past three years on a variety of issues, which I'll talk about in, in a minute. Um, and so now that they have a majority, a Democratic majority, that they're going to be revisiting these types of issues and trying to get different decisions where she believes that the board had overruled legal precedent during the past three years. She also identified other initiatives and areas that she wanted to carefully examine. And then she gave advice on case handling matters that, um, that were traditionally submitted to advice 
that she'll be taking a more aggressive approach on. But what I found most interesting were the subjects where she believed that the board had overruled prior legal precedent. Um, and two of them certainly are worthy of, of merit and talking about. Um, one is employee handbooks. So she believed that there were a number of provisions in employee handbooks that were overreaching and two are confidentiality agreements and severance agreements. So confidentiality provisions and severance agreements. So the board previously ruled that confidentiality provisions and severance agreements and non-disparagement provisions and severance agreements, imagine, right, employee sues you, <laughs> you're going to enter into full release. There's a standard confidentiality provision and there's a standard non-disparagement provision. And the board had previously recognized that such provisions did not violate the National Labor Relations Act or their right for concerted activity, right? And she is challenging that decision, basically saying we're going to retest those waters to see if a traditional confidentiality agreement or non-disparagement agreement would, in fact, violate an employee's rights to engage in concerted activity, to talk about the employer and the work conditions, whether or not they're employed there or not, um, whether or not they're settling those claims or not. So. Certainly for HR professionals who are listening to this and attorneys, they'll be interested to look at whether or not that is one of the first cases that are tested. For those of you that are interested, it's about a 10 page memo. Um, I won't belabor all of the issues, but I do think that it certainly highlights her agenda for the next three years about what we're going to be seeing. Let me take a step, quick step back. Um, and talk about OSHA changes and enforcement priorities, certainly under the American Rescue Plan. Um, <clears throat> OSHA is going to have a larger role. Um, we have new COVID safety rules that we've already talked about. And then we've already seen, as I said, increased staffing, which equals increased inspections. And then there are some changes to reporting for workplace injuries under forms 300 and 301. And then also they're going to be requiring or increasing those forms to be submitted electronically or online. So for those of you who are tasked with reporting certain workplace injuries, make sure that you're uh, familiar with those new or upcoming electronic submission requirements for employers of certain sizes. And then what is going to be a new and I think kind of in interesting um, enforcement priority and change for safety regulations in a modern world is OSHA's looking into exploring new lockout and tag out procedures for computer based control systems. So as we increase technology and improve technology in the construction trades and in manufacturing, if you have a computer based control system for lockout tag out, they're going to actually adopt some regulations for those controls. And that should be probably coming in the next year or so. So DOL enforcement priorities, the American Rescue Plan, of course, it said that they intend to create new jobs and it highlighted it, however, in the actual plan, the increased scrutiny on independent contractor status for misclassification. One of the additional issues that we saw since the Biden administration uh, came in was the idea that they stopped the National Labor Relations Board, um, their definition of independent contractor. Right. So we were hoping for a formal rule from the National Labor Relations Board that defined who is and is not an independent contractor. And the Biden administration under um, and that NLRB actually rescinded the independent contractor rule. As well as uh, a joint employer rule. So what does that mean by way of rescission or going back to the old sort of status quo? Right. Is that there's an increased likelihood that you as an employer may be deemed to be a joint employer or you as an employer may be deemed to be an employer of an independent contractor. There's going to be a heightened scrutiny and B, we're hoping for some sort of cohesive rule out of this over the next right that we've kind of been struggling with, um, had been looking to the NLRB. Certainly the rules are always different for who is and is not an independent contractor depending 
depending on who is asking, but we were hoping for some sort of cohesive rule that we could look to, um, whether it's under the NLRA or the Department of Labor. And because that rule was rescinded, sort of goes back to the status quo of looking at all of the different factors as opposed to sort of a more cohesive rule. So if you use independent contractors, whether it's in a unionized environment or not, certainly your collective bargaining agreement might address that, that issue. But outside of those employees who are members of a union, if you have office staff or other projects in which you're using independent contractors, certainly be aware that that could be a risk that they would be deemed to be an employee. Um, also, I thought of merit for this audience, right? We have a lot of employees who go through apprenticeship programs with their respective trades. The American Rescue Plan actually has a NAT is supporting the National Apprenticeship Act of 2021 that's sort of percolating through. Um, we might see it in now be of 2022, but basically what it is, it's to do away with industry recognized apprenticeship programs and adhere to a formal apprenticeship program um, with that's governed by regulation. Why is because essentially what the those proponents of this National Apprenticeship Act say is that in informal programs, people are underpaid for the training and service that they're providing, um, that they're not paid requisite with the services and duties that they're providing, and they'd like to increase the wages that those individuals are earning. Um, so keep an eye on that. You might hear more about that. Um, and then the fight for 15, of course, although this might not necessarily apply to this audience, certainly I think we're going to hear a, a lot more about that on both the state and federal levels. So Another thing to watch is the PRO Act. If you've never heard of the PRO Act, if, if somebody um, in, in the room, if you've never heard about the PRO Act or, or out there, um, it's the Protection, um, Protecting the Right to Organize Act. Um, it was passed by the House of Representatives in early 2020, and it will certainly be a top labor policy for congressional Democrats to revisit the PRO Act. Um, it's essentially, or could be the biggest and most wide sweeping sort of labor act as a whole if it passes. So if um, the Democrats now have the ability to actually get it passed, um, then subsequently in the Senate, the bill would codify certain joint employer rules, making those more strict, um, address email access rules regarding union employees' email access, as well as if somebody is campaigning, um, address the persuader rules, right? So there was issues certainly dating back to 2016. If you're going through a union campaign, who is and is not a persuader and who must disclose advice under the persuader rules. Uh, they would prohibit right to work laws in many states that have them. Um, so and provide stealth card check act. So those are just the top kind of things the PRO Act would do. They would also allow civil penalties, including liquidated damages for violations of the act. So really wide sweeping changes in the labor movement and would be something that all employers would really have to study and take note of. Some notable Supreme Court labor and employment decisions. Um, this just actually came out, Cedar Point Nursery versus Hasid. This is um, a case from the United States Supreme Court. Um, it limited, pardon me, it limited union organizers' access to an employer's property. Now, this is under a California regulation that was dismissed. Essentially, it the Supreme Court ruled that union organizers who were going on to an employer's property, um, that the employer had to allow them to come onto the property. And under this California regulation, the regulation was rescinded and the court ruled that the regulation essentially was an unfair taking under the Constitution, right? So if you had to allow individual these union organizers onto your property, that it was an unfair taking without compensation of your property. So why I 
raise this is that it is insightful into how the current Supreme Court makeup might rule on other labor issues. So we've just talked about, right, a really strong Department of Labor and a really strong National Labor Relations Board that would be geared more toward enforcing or increasing or expanding um, the right to unionize and other union-based issues, where I think that you're going to see some pushback on the other side is the Supreme Court. Right, so this is really indicative and I think insightful of how the Supreme Court may rule on other labor and employment issues. Um, some other cases that we saw were that touched on labor and employment issues were religious exemption cases um, from the, the court. And we're going to see a new docket in beginning in October of 2021 um, through the 2022 cases. The first set of cases um, from the Supreme Court. Really, there's not much of note from the employment or labor front. Last year, of course, we were looking at whether Title VII included sexual orientation and transgender status, but there's not one seminal case that I would necessarily highlight, but the Supreme Court is take for at least the October term, but the Supreme Court is taking on certainly more cert cases, and those will be some to watch. So, uh, transitioning now from the pandemic and changes in government to changes in things that you may have missed in the chaos of, of 2020 and the beginning of 2021. So as I just mentioned, if you didn't hear, right, the Supreme Court held in the June of last year that sexual orientation and gender identity or transgender status are two protected statuses under the rubric of sex under Title VII. So from an update standpoint, if you haven't updated your sexual harassment or EEO policies, certainly recommend taking a look at that to make sure that it's clear that sexual orientation and transgender status are protected characteristics and won't be discriminated against um, by any employer. What a different decision that you may not have heard about is non-competes. Supreme Court, Pennsylvania, not, you, not U.S. Supreme Court, Pennsylvania Supreme Court decision ruling on non-competes. Non-competes, right, seem sort of run of the mill. We've had them. What's new about non-competes in the law? Well, this was a really interesting decision that was somewhat unexpected in the sense that uh, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court invalidated a non-compete where an employee did not sign it at the commencement of employment. He had been presented with it. The employee sort of hemmed and hawed, you know, put it in, in their desk, said, I'll get back to you a little bit later, and only signed it several weeks into his employment. Later, after he was separated from employment and began competing with the employer, the employer said, no, no, we have a non-compete, right? You're subject to a non-compete. He said, no, I, I didn't sign it at the commencement of my employment. It's not valid. And so legal, as legal practitioners, we have long, right, kind of adhered to, well, if you're aware of it, right? Even if there's a lot going on in your first day of employment, We've either told you in an offer letter and attached a non-compete to your offer letter or presented it to you on your first day of employment so you're aware that the consideration for this job offer and is signing the non-compete in exchange for the job offer. You have to do it. It should be valid even if it's backdated and you sign it a few days into your employment. Well, that's no longer the case. So the Pennsylvania Supreme Court invalidated that non-compete that wasn't signed at or before employment. And so be really cautious if you're kind of uh, a little behind on your paperwork or even, of course, in the world of remote work and COVID, if you're having employees sign paperwork later, recommend presenting it to the employee with the offer letter and not allowing that employee to start employment until they've signed it on their first day of employment or else you really are risking um, having that non-compete non-solicitation and other types of restrictive covenants be declared invalid. Um, this is just, an, and the third thing is in a Pennsylvania Supreme Court decision that ruled that time spent for security screening um, is in fact hours worked under the Pennsylvania Minimum Wage Act. So there is no de minimis exception. We might think, right, you might have heard of Amazon being sued for 
employees having to queue up or line up to go through security and COVID screenings, temperature protocols, et cetera. And we're familiar with the donning and doffing of putting on a security equipment. And the idea that so long it was de minimis under a few minutes, et cetera, that it wasn't necessarily compensable time under the federal law. Well, that's not necessarily true under the Pennsylvania Minimum Wage Act. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court ruled uh, just this month that time spent for security screening is in fact compensable time. So you have to, if that if those employees are lining up before they even get into the building essentially and have clocked in, that is still compensable time. It doesn't necessarily matter that they've dinged the clock, so to speak. And I think that this decision will have larger implications for other donning and doffing cases under the Pennsylvania Minimum Wage Act. Um, Talking about things and transitioning into things relative to discrimination and other types of uh, things that will be on the horizon, right? Gender discrimination is still alive and well in the workplace. What we've seen over the past year, um, gender and race harassment or claims are increasing. Um, there's concerns about hundreds of thousands of women dropping out of the workforce as a result of COVID and the need to telework and, and care for family and children at home. So what is expected as a result? Increased pay equity and transparency laws, which is again a focus of the Biden administration. So the, it has the Biden administration has stated that it has a focus on pay equity laws, meaning that you can't ask, for example, um, what an employee might be making to try to decrease the differential between the gender gap or the gender pay gap. So several states have laws. Um, so if you work, certainly Pennsylvania does not, but if you do work or are hiring remotely or across the country, there are various laws that prohibit employers from um, asking or discussing wages and how much an employee say for made at their prior employment, how much they would be looking to make based on what they previously made historically. So if you're saying how much did you make at your last job, that's a question on your application. You should really, even if you're in Pennsylvania, really think about is that a question that you want to ask? Um, of course, we as employers, we want a good bargain, right? We want to be competitive. Um, it is a competitive market in recruiting um, and so on. You know, people are having trouble finding work. We want to offer bonuses and so on. But I expect this list for asking how much you previously made, whether it's at your uh, a salaried position or an hourly position, to increase. Um, and I believe it might be um, something that Governor Wolf has talked about before the pandemic. So wouldn't be surprised if we saw that percolating through the next year. And again, salary history ban, same thing. So this is a list of states, Philadelphia and Pittsburgh for public employers actually have current salary history ban questions. So that doesn't apply for contractors of public entities, but Again, that's a separate way that we could see that increase is that the city of Pittsburgh could say that contractors who do work for us are prohibited from asking salary history questions. Another issue that I've seen increase is requirement for annual sexual harassment training or other types of sexual harassment or other harassment policies. So. Um, this is a list if you conduct business out of state of those states that require annual sexual harassment training. And if you have if you have an ongoing project in a different state construction project, you may be required to actually conduct that harassment training. So it, just because you're a Pennsylvania employer, if you're going in your construction project last six months, it may bring you under the umbrella of require, being required to for employees who are assigned to that project in Delaware, in Maryland, in New York to conduct that training, even though your EIN is here in Pennsylvania. Okay. Yep, there's a question. Oh, Maryland, you say mandatory mm -hmm. disclosures. Is that 
disclosures of your policy or disclosures of the events of harassment that have occurred with your company? Yes. Well, so there is in Maryland, um, there is no training requirement, but an employer has to disclose any types of claims or settlement, both internal or external. So if you're doing business again in Maryland um, and that deadline had already passed in 2020. So if you haven't made your disclosure yet, certainly put it on your radar to do so um, almost immediately. And certainly if you have any questions, we can help you through that process. Um, taking a little transition, kind of a potpourri, as we said, of things we might have missed. Uh, medical marijuana in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania's Medical Marijuana Act, or Act uh, 16, as it's also referred to, does contain an anti-discrimination provision, right? It prohibits employers from discriminating against employees or applicants who have a medical marijuana card. Now, what does that mean, right? Can I refuse to hire somebody because they might be coming to work under the influence? We can't presume, we can't presume that that's the case if they simply have a card. Now, what if an employee or an applicant sued you, right, under this anti-discrimination provision? Well, just a week ago, the Pennsylvania Superior Court ruled that employees do have a private right of action to sue for discrimination and recoup damages for claims of discrimination on their status as a medical marijuana card holder. So that was sort of in flux. It was a question, does the act actually provide a private right of action? The Pennsylvania Superior Court, so now it's at the appellate level, has ruled that in fact it does. So if you've been sort of poo-pooing this law and saying, ah, I don't have to really worry about it necessarily, it's certainly as of last week, it has been confirmed that they, employees have a private cause of action to sue for discrimination. So let's talk about that for a minute then. What do you do or what can you do to protect yourself? Well, the Medical Marijuana Act says that an employee is not permitted to report to work under the influence of medical marijuana. Right. So if you're dealing with an applicant, you can't necessarily pre screen them and say if you're doing drug screening, um, if they can't pass a pre employment drug screen, they've never reported to work under the influence. So you would be at potentially at risk if you refuse to make an exception for that applicant if they could produce a valid medical marijuana card. Conversely, when we're talking about employees, right? If we're talking about employees who may have reported to work or do report to work, they can't report to work under the influence. How do we know if they're under the influence, right? Courts have said from different states, albeit different states, but Rhode Island and Delaware have said that it's sort of hand in hand, goes hand in hand, that an employee who has a medical marijuana card is going to use medical marijuana, right? Ergo, they're going to test positive because marijuana stays in the system for weeks, days, et cetera, for, for somebody who's consistently using marijuana. So take a pivot to science, right? Is that what certainly the courts in Arizona have said is that you should be conducting drug tests that test the active amount of THC in the employee's body or system. And there are drug tests that are available to show you if the employee is actively impaired and has showed up to work under the influence. So what can you do? Um, for an employee with a medical marijuana card is proactively understand if they in fact have a medical marijuana card, have policies that require employees, not just medical marijuana card holders, but all employees who might be taking other prescription or over the counter or other types of drugs that could impair them at work to disclose that to you. Not the underlying condition, right? Not why they have a card or why they're taking prescription drugs, but that they are. And so you can be prepared in the case of a medical marijuana card holder if they have an accident and they go for post-accident testing or they appear at work impaired or they're going undergoing a random drug screen to have your, med your drug testing provider test for the active amounts of THC in the employee's body because a normal urine test will not do it. Make sense? Be prepared. There are certain drug testing vendors out there that have that capability. It's a little more expensive, but it's certainly worth it to make sure that you've addressed whether somebody is actively impaired as opposed to simply having a pure uh, positive test in your urine screen, which would not show that. Finally, um, this 
probably or, or likely did uh, kind of not hit your radar, but if it did, that would be, that's great. If it didn't, this is something that you should consider, particularly for construction trades or contractors. The American Rescue Plan Act contains certain provisions that affect multi-employer pension funds. So all of those funds that you all contribute as a construction trade, right? And essentially, it recognizes that 1,400 multi-employer plans in the U.S., that there are 1,400, and out of them, more than over 100 are seriously underfunded, right? Seriously underfunded. So if you are an employer who contributes to a multi-employer plan, how many of you either out there or listening or here remotely, do you know what the current status of your pension fund is? The health and status of the funds that you're contributing to? Many people don't. Um, so under the American Rescue Plan, uh, that provided for contribution to these underfunded or seriously underfunded plans to bring them into a healthier status. So this is the first time essentially that Congress is going to contribute money to a private multi-employer pension fund under the American Rescue Plan Act. If you don't know if one of your funds could be affected, certainly it's something that you would want to find out to see if also, even if say you have a moderately healthy fund or pension plan that you're contributing to, you should know about it. If most employers um, ask yourself, do you actually ask for the status or the health report of your fund? Do you know what your withdrawal liability is if you needed to remove yourself as an as a employer from that fund? You have a right as an employer um, generally to ask for that. Um, on an annual basis and receive an annual withdrawal liability assessment. Um, why would you want to do that? Well, it can affect, right, if you're considering a sale of your business or a transfer of a certain part of your business, it certainly can affect the value of that transaction. So I always say it's better to know than not know. Um, and it, certainly those requests can take a number of months, if not um, certainly weeks. And so certainly to put on your radar to say, Okay, do I know the health of my fund? Um, do I know how much it would cost me to get out if I needed to, or if I was considering a sale or transaction of my business? What would be the value of that withdrawal liability if I needed to assess it? So in closing, that's something that probably through, um, if you didn't know, you know, Congress is going to take those federal funding steps for those seriously underfunded plans and certainly something that you might want to look into. But with that, I think we've sort of touched a lot of our topics. If anybody has any questions, I don't know, either here in the room or online. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Do we have any questions? We'll double check. Okay. Well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. If you have any questions about any of the topics that we've covered, feel free to reach out either by a phone or email at kirwin at FBT Law. Happy to talk about um, any of the topics that we've covered or answer any additional questions. Um, and thank you and stay safe and stay healthy. Okay, <clears throat> Kate, thank you for uh, for your presentation today. I know that the, uh, the uh, bullet points you put up at the start were uh, We've been asked those several times, so to get uh, clarification on those has, has been fantastic. It was spot on uh, what we saw, so really appreciate it. Uh, this session was recorded. It'll be available for uh, review by everybody uh, later today. So if you do have any questions, you can contact Kate or you can send an email to info at mbawpa.org. Uh, tomorrow at one o'clock, MBA is hosting a uh, session on what to expect uh, in safety going forward, we have Jim Stanley, who uh, was the highest uh, political appointee in OSHA under in the Bush administration. And we have Jim Sullivan, who was chairman of the Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission uh, under the Trump administration. So we've gone to the top to uh, try and figure out what to expect. These guys have some great guidance for us. And uh, that's tomorrow at one o'clock. At Hotel Indigo, it's an in-person event. Uh, we have plenty of space to uh, spread out, so we appreciate everybody. And then, then on Wednesday, we're having a hurricane party at Laurel Valley, so uh, look forward to that. But Okay, thank you very much for attending today, and uh, have a great week.